let's take a look at inverse trigonometric functions. When we're working with trigonometric functions, sometimes we'll know the angle measure and we'll want to find a missing side length in a triangle perhaps, but other times we'll know the ratio of those side lengths and we'll want to find that angle measure. So to do that we'll use the inverses. Now remember that when we're working with the unit circle the cosine of theta is equal to x, the sine of theta is equal to y, and the tangent of theta is equal to y over x. Okay, so we can use those to help us to find those inverse um, trigonometric uh, relations. So this one, for example, the inverse cosine of negative square root of 3 over 2, what we're going to want to do is remember that the cosine is the x value from these ordered pairs that we see going around the unit circle. So I'm going to look through the x values and see if I can't find this negative square root of 3 over 2. Let's see. Hey, there's one. And here's another one. So I have um, for that first one, let's go in the upper uh, left there, we have 5 pi over 6. And then the second one down here, we have 7 pi over 6. And those are, of course, both radians. Now, with the inverse uh, inverses, we see that there can actually be a number of different, infinitely many in fact, different angle measures that would relate to this particular um, ratio. So uh, what we need to do is take that into account. So the first one here, we go around to 5 pi over 6. Well, what would happen if I went around the entire circle again? I could end up in that same spot. So what I need to do is say plus 2 pi times n. And n, I'm going to write underneath here, n is an integer. Because what that says, or what that means, is that I'm taking into account all those times that I could go around the unit circle. So it's just an extra rotation there, and it's getting all of those potential um, inverses. So same thing here, we're going to have plus 2 pi times n. So that takes into account all of the rotations where I can end up at that particular point. Okay, how about this next one, the inverse sine of 1 half. Remember the sine is the y coordinate, so I'm going to look through the y coordinates here on my unit circle and see if I can't find where we have a y coordinate that's 1 half. Well, here's one at pi over 6, so that's going to be one potential. And then let's see, one half in the y's. Hey, there's another one, 5 pi over 6. That one shows up again. Okay, same situation. I need to take into account and um, recognize all the potential rotations that would l have me stopping at that same point. So I'm going to add fi 2 pi times n where n is an integer. So that takes care of all the different rotations that I could have where I'll stop in the same place there. Finally this last one, the t inverse tangent is 1. Well the tangent is y over x. So what I really need to do here is look for where both coordinates are the same. Because what's going to happen there is that they're just going to when we divide something by itself, it's going to give me that 1. So as I look here, hey, there's one where they're the same, the square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, and here's another one where they're both the same. So my two values for that one are going to be pi over 4, and then plus the 2 pi times n again to take into account all those rotations, and then this one right here, 
5 pi over 4 and again plus 2 pi times n again n is an integer now this is not a function because there's all those different potential values so in order for it to be a function what we have to do is restrict where we're going to look on the unit circle so let's take a look at that quickly next so we tell the difference because notice how now we have capital letters on our cosine sine and tangent and what that does is it restricts us to particular areas and the cosine of theta still is equal to x but it's restricted on our unit circle to the top two segments the top two quadrants the sine of theta is equal to y still and that one is restricted on our co unit circle to quadrants one and four and finally the tangent whoops should be writing these with capital letters the tangent of theta is y over x and that is also restricted to quadrants one and four so and as we look at it it makes sense because notice like for the sine that's the y values look at the y values here we have the square root of three over two square root of two over two one half and then we have negatives of those things if i would go over here then i start to get those repeating values which i don't want so we have to stick to this particular section of the unit circle if we're working with the sine or the tangent same thing for the cosine notice we have all the potential values up here for the x's here's the negative ones here's the positive ones so that takes care of all those potential values if we go down here we start to get repeats which is the problem and we can't have that if it's going to be a function so that's what's going on there so let's take a look at this one the inverse cosine of the square root of 3 over 2 well remember that the cosine is the x and a way that you can remember which is which we can just look at them in alphabetical order cosine comes before sine x before y then we gotta just kinda remember tangent that's kind of its own special case so cosine we're looking in the top two quadrants and I'm looking for the x coordinate of each of these points to be the square root of 3 over 2 let's see oh, there it is so the inverse cosine of the square root of 3 over 2 is 30 degrees or pi over 6 okay same type thing for this one except that we're gonna be looking for a y coordinate and it's in these first two quadrants so let's see the y coordinate that has negative square root of 2 over 2 hey there it is in this case it is 315 degrees or 7 pi over 4 okay again tangent remember tangent is y over x so I'm also restricted to these two so to get that square root of 3 well first of all I know it's positive so it's not going to involve any of these also I know that when I do that division the y over x this would just give me one so it's got to be one of these two let's see let's try this one right here so we have one half divided by the square root of three over two well I have to flip that so that's gonna be equal to one half times two over the square root of three cancel those out oops that's not gonna get me what I want so it must be this one right here let's try that one we have the square root of three over two and we are dividing that by one half oops excuse me holy cow I goofed up there let me go back I was taking the y over the x or the x over the y remember it's y over x so y over x let's try this one 
We have one half. Actually, I tried that one before and it didn't work. So let's go back. Ooh, struggling. Holy cow. Let's see. <laughs> it is square root of 3 over 2. And that's going to be divided by 1 half. Then I'm going to do the keep change flip for those fractions. Change this to multiplication. Then the 2's cancel out. And I'm left with just the square root of 3. So that one is this right here which is 60 degrees or pi over 3. Okay, so inverse trigonometric functions. For it to be a function, we have to restrict it to a particular area so that we don't have any repeating values. And remember that the cosine is restricted to the top two quadrants. The sine and the tangent are restricted to the quadrants 1 and 4. And we denote those uh, restricted versions, the functions, by using capital letters, the capital C, S, and T. Then, in the, just looking at the relation, remember there's really an infinite number of potential angles that would yield the cosine, sine, tangents, all those trigonometric uh, values there. And we need to account for those by saying plus 2 pi, which is just another rotation, times n, where n is an integer, because then that accounts for all those different rotations. Hope this video was helpful. Uh, keep working hard on your math, and I know you will do fantastic.